you always say like you always hear people saying like take the ego out of it but i did it differently <laughs> and i put my ego right in yeah <laughs> everybody welcome back to the jesse nyberg podcast this is the halloween episode i'm here with caroline you may remember her from we recorded i think probably almost a year ago now or eight months so it's back or first repeat guest it's caroline 2.0 how you doing yes sir <laughs> hi i'm very happy to be back a lot has happened since we last talked I know it's uh it's crazy looking back at some of the episodes and just seeing like it doesn't feel like that long ago but when you look at them you're just like damn it's like a totally different place with like everything that's happened online all the stuff you've been doing all the stuff I've been doing it's like a very different perspective from last time definitely definitely like <laughs> I guess we're going to talk about it later but my life like it flipped since we did the first podcast, so I'm excited to talk about all of that in a bit. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, same same goes for me, and I thought you'd be a good person to re have a repeat guest because I figured I want to start bringing a few people back on and some of the favorites, and also a lot of your stuff is very spooky and uh, Halloween-esque already, so I thought it's kind of kind of a no-brainer, you know? <laughs> fits the occasion very well huh <laughs> yeah do you have anything planned that you're going to be doing for halloween or anything this year uh not yet i'm probably gonna meet some, with some friends like have a chill time together mm -hmm. um but not much sadly there are not many parties going on because you know covid and all of that yeah <laughs> so uh, sadly not a big party or anything but it's gonna be a chill time yeah with some friends yeah last year it was like definitely no parties too i we went uh me and some friends went out into like this desert and had like a little rave thing but it was all just controlled like only people we knew so it was like but now it seems like i don't know it's weird different places you go they have a lot different i guess like levels of strictness on like covid and parties like there's some places out here it's like it's as if never existed already you know and then there's other places where <laughs> it feels like just yeah. how it did during like the peak or something yeah true i mean yeah places and parties are slowly starting to open up mm -hmm. like the more people get vaccinated and the more people have recovered from covid and all of that like you have to show your little like vaccination yeah. card that you that you are fully vaccinated so that you can even join like you can even go to restaurants or parties right. and everything so it's starting to be a bit more normal if you went through all of that but yeah there are still restrictions and all of that so mm -hmm. no big parties or something sadly but i think that's another uh, reason since we last chatted it, it feels like a lot's changed but it doesn't feel like like it really wasn't that long ago but it's because we everyone's kind of been in this like cycle of doing the same kind of things like over and over i feel like time has kind of completely changed on like compared to how it was before like my uh like a month will go by and i don't even really notice it because i'm just kind of doing like the same stuff in the same office every day <laughs> yeah right like i just sit at home all day mm -hmm. and then like I check my calendar and I see that it's mid-October already and I'm wondering like what the fuck where is the year yeah <laughs> like what happens I know it's crazy <laughs> like it's so bizarre I've right? been um <laughs> I think also since uh I'm traditionally a little bit more not introverted but I only like to go out like if I really want to go to something I don't just go out for no reason but lately <laughs> I've been kind of doing like going out more with my friends because I feel like I have to like almost make up for it. Like I've been doing nothing for so long that anytime something comes up, I'm like, all right, I guess we'll, I guess we'll go do it. Yeah. The FOMO is real. Mm -hmm. Like we've just been sitting at home pretty much for like the past, I don't know, one and a half years. So, you know, now that there are more parties and stuff like that happening, like, of course you're going to go there because yeah. you missed it. <laughs> That's what I've been doing at least. Like, uh, uh, yeah. you've just been, uh, pretty much working on a lot more commissions and stuff like that right 
Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, since we last talked, I finished a 365 poster project, like a year of daily posters. Mm -hmm. And then I finally got a freelancer license, which is very great. I have to pay taxes at some point. I love that for me. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I basically did commissions. I worked with some brands, which was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. yeah, like that happened. That was very cool. Like, I didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah, how far along were you in, I think when the, we last talked, you were maybe 70% done with like the 365, something <sighs> around there. I don't know. I think I was like in the in the last quarter of yeah. the project, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, how, yeah, how does it feel completing that? that? Is it like, was it weird when you finally <laughs> finished? It was weird because suddenly I didn't have this thing to do like on a daily basis mm -hmm. anymore. But it was also kind of a relief because, you know, I'm still a student right. next to my whole design thing. So I was really enjoying just, you know, taking a break, being like, oh, nice. I don't have to do like a post for Instagram yeah. every day anymore. So I really enjoyed that. Like, it's weird because sometimes I wish I could just continue doing it or like do it a second time, but then I'm like, nah, mm. we're not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm glad that it's over. I learned a lot from it, but I wouldn't do it a second time, definitely. <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems like when most people do that, like it's not as popular anymore. I feel like it, uh, a few years ago, everyone was doing like a 365 thing on Instagram, but it seems like no matter who you talk to, they are always like, yes, I got like all these like, followers or I met all these people or I got it as a better designer but they say all these things and then they still say but I wouldn't do it again or like I don't recommend it <laughs> yeah definitely like I sort of discovered my style through doing all of mm -hmm. that because I I just didn't feel like doing the same thing over and over again because like that's not why I'm doing it because I really wanted to challenge myself right. and like see how far I can take everything and also to see like how my style evolves over time because I think that's very interesting to see how it just changes in like a year mm -hmm. um, based on all the influences I have and based on all the people I follow and all of that so that's definitely cool I learned a lot in a fairly short amount of time and that's what this project is great for but right. yeah <laughs> it's just a huge commitment like if you do stuff Like, I don't know, even if you study or something like that can get very stressful with like even making something for Instagram, um, which is why I'm very glad that I don't have to do it daily yeah. anymore because I honestly couldn't manage to do it anymore with timing and everything. Mm -hmm. Has your How has your kind of approach uh, or like design process then changed with Instagram and stuff since you finished that? Do you have a new kind of, uh, I guess, schedule you work along or way you do things? Uh, it's just more sporadic because I don't really like forcing myself mm -hmm. to design if I don't feel like it. But sometimes I just have an idea and then I just grab my laptop and then I just do it and upload it uh, at some point through the day. But it's not as strict as it was when I did the 365 because it's not like I have to post. Right. I post because I want to or because I have something that I just really want to show people. Right. Yeah, I'm sure when you were kind of when you put those constraints on yourself, like there's something uh, in like psychology about like losing a streak like it's very frustrating and like it's almost like yeah <laughs> when you start doing something for even 30 days in a row it develops such a habit that breaking that habit or breaking that streak feels like the end of the world like you'll do anything to not <laughs> mess that up yeah exactly exactly that was the thing because i had to take i think three days off during the whole mm. project like i did the i did the numbers anyway but i think uh, at some point i was like sick which is oh, okay. why I couldn't do it and one time I had to recover from a vaccination yeah so I didn't I couldn't do anything in these few days so I just skipped these and that's important to tell people that they mm -hmm. can actually take breaks breaks if they need to but yeah it's I mean it's a habit and you do feel kind of guilty when you break it even if you know it's necessary right. but it's like man I did this for like 200 days in a row and now I'm sick and I have to take a break from this why mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why all those like you see a lot of apps and stuff too. like they'll send you notifications and things like, oh, it's your 10th day in a row of like this streak. If it's like some kind of learning thing or like a gaming thing, like I, there's something yeah about that. Like people can't get over the fact of messing up a streak. And that's like that's all it takes. Like I think once I start doing something for even like even a week, once you if you could get a whole week down of doing something, whether it's like designing every day, working out, you know, eating healthy, like 
once you develop the habit, like it's, it, it feels worse to not do it than the, than the idea of being like, oh, I don't want to do this today, you know? Yeah, definitely. Like you have to ease yourself into it a bit at first. Like you can tell yourself, okay, I'm going to do a week, mm -hmm. see how it goes. Okay, two weeks, I'll see how it goes. A month, I see how it goes. And that's sort of how I approached the 365 because I just really wanted to try it out and see whether it worked for me or not. Right. Like, it was a spoiler in the end, it did. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's not a one size fits all. Like everyone has like a method that mm -hmm. works for them. Like sometimes you got to set yourself like, small goals okay i'm gonna do a week i'm gonna do two weeks i'm gonna do a month two three and so on it goes really like you you gotta keep track of it if you really want to do it yeah and yeah like you said i mean it, it did it really did work it seems like i mean your your stuff's been kind of popping off since we last chatted i know you have like twenty thousand followers or something like that and <laughs> Do you think that just yeah. posting good work, like very consistently, that's just kind of what's promoted this growth and like gotten you more clients and stuff, just kind of being there and like getting better? Yeah, definitely that. And also something that people always say is to make relatable work mm. that I don't really focus on like making my work relatable because mostly my work is inspired by music I like or just like general concepts mm -hmm. I'm interested in at the time. But if you make something that people relate to or something like, you know, that that'll get shared a lot and people like that right. and people engage with that type of content more. And that's pretty much what got me my clients because I mainly do stuff that's inspired by like alternative music. So most of the clients I had so far, they were like in the whole indie alternative type mm -hmm. of scene. So that's sort of a pro thing right <laughs> like you know just making content you like um you know trying to connect with the people that follow you mm -hmm. people you would want to like to have following you and stuff like that so that's kind of yeah what i did <laughs> right yeah i have uh, I remember i was talking to when i had a uh, ed uh ed rika on the podcast he was talking to me about how so like the majority of his audience is very like non it's not other designers and stuff it's very uh people that just appreciate like his posts and share it a lot and like the art for art's sake and i realized like those are like that kind of audience is really good for the algorithm because other design like half my followers are probably other designers so it's like they're not really sharing as much unless they're trying to support you they're not like and like they i feel like as designers you look at a post differently you're like you're like looking at how they did it or like maybe uh <laughs> like just like oh that's like a cool little thing they did right there rather than just a normal consumer is like that looks cool i like the quote put it on my story you know and that helps a lot more yeah right like if you do content you know to certain bands that people like a lot like you know a band i did a lot of posters for were bands like typo negative or mm -hmm. nine inch nails and those are very much like cult favorites i guess right in the sort of like alternative world and you know you don't really see it in like modern design like when people make design for music like mostly it's like the more contemporary rap stuff which is also cool mm -hmm. i like that but it's not the kind of stuff i'm personally interested in so when people that don't really are in the design world mm -hmm. see someone that makes content about the music or like the subcultures they like like they connect with it differently right and like even even designers i know like they connect with my work a bit differently because they also don't really see it as designer to designer but more like design enjoyer to designer yeah yeah and i think it's true like your uh your style uh everything from like the copy you do and like the style you work in that's very reminiscent of like a lot of 80s and 90s punk and post-punk like zine stuff i think the type of people that like that stuff maybe like alternative more counterculture type of consumers they are uh, a lot more dedicated i think to that specific niche rather than if you were just like 20k of those super dedicated niche like p audience or fans is probably stronger than like you know 50 or 60k like more general and generic just like i guess mainstream type stuff 
Yeah, right. Like I never really thought about like having a niche or something mm -hmm. or like a type of style that I'll consistently do because like when I first started it, I was like, okay, I'm doing all of this for myself. Right. I'm doing the content that I would want to see. I'm going to do the posters that I would like to have hanging in my room. Mm -hmm. Like you always say, like you always hear people saying like, take the ego out of it, but I did it differently <laughs> and I put my ego right in. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, like when I think, okay, like I as an alternative person would enjoy this type of content, like why wouldn't other alternative mm -hmm. people like enjoy this content? Because, you know, you don't really see it in like the design world, really. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my niche, like the whole spooky alternative stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with it. Like I yeah. made some friends in that kind of like design sphere. Um, and I'm very glad about that because, you know, when you look at design, you don't really see people that do the stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. So when I find people that do this type of stuff, like I'm, I get very happy, like as yeah. just an alternative person and a consumer in that sense. Yeah. And it's crazy. So in that way I can really relate to the people that follow me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, what's interesting about this style that you kind of have developed out and work in is a lot of the old, like stuff that you pull inspiration from like the people that were making those like they weren't even designers you know like a lot of them were <laughs> uh i guess either artists or like just people in bands and stuff and like it's crazy to look back on some of that stuff and and like whether like they probably weren't taught it but there's so much like cool like fundamentals and just like actual good typography and layout and like it was all just innate like feeling of how something should look it wasn't there's no rules or like rigid I guess, guidelines to follow or anything. Yeah, right. Like, that's so funny because when you consider that I was actually like, I have formal design mm -hmm. training, I know like design theory and all that stuff. But um, like doing this type of style was like really freeing in a way because I could just like turn my design brain off for a while yeah. and just put like squares on other squares <laughs> and have fun with what I'm doing yeah. <laughs> basically. And that was just really fun. Like I really enjoyed doing this type of like alternative work a bit more because I could just like make my turn my brain off a bit mm -hmm. while working and not just be thinking like is the contrast right or like is the font too big yeah oh my god should i use Arial or not <laughs> so you know it's like very freeing because there are really like no rules to like how to do the style really and i think it's just so much more fun to do that than like clean design mm -hmm. like i can do it but i don't want to most of the time yeah it's funny too because <laughs> like even though i've talked to you in discord and stuff and pretty much I may be wrong, but it seems like all of your work or if not all, most of it is done digitally, even though it has like a very analog feel and stuff. And I remember you talking about uh, Obi from Obi and Japari being like, oh, is this real or, or is this analog or not? And like, that's like, what a better um, like test to know that you're actually capturing that style and that <laughs> essence of something, you know? Right. Like, I was really flattered when he said that, like, Obi is also a German designer, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Like, I know, like, five German designers, but it's cool that I got to connect with him uh, via Twitter, with Rob, yeah. which was really nice. And I was, like, uh, I, I was so surprised when he said that he couldn't tell whether my work was, like, analog or not. And mm -hmm. I was, like, man, like, you do this work where I wonder exactly the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, like, really cool. Like, I'm always happy when people say that they can't tell whether my work is, like, made digitally mm -hmm. or not but really the whole secret is just to use textures that are like actual textures like pieces of paper right. or like the whole copy scan thing from black market mm -hmm. you know like working with real scanned materials and then like a little bit of digital magic in there mm -hmm. yeah and i feel like uh one thing that i think that makes your work so uh reminiscent and believable of like this kind of xerox style is the color choices you use of the paper they're very like spot on to the colors that are available actually in that like construction paper um like uh, let's see like this <laughs> you know yeah see i have exactly the same pieces of paper at home <laughs> yeah sorry uh, if anyone's <laughs> on the audio um, i went to grab paper but like this uh, i mean <laughs> this green is is like so this is caroline's color you know right here yeah <laughs> That's my brand color yeah. and I actually like chose that off of this type of green that the like pastel yeah. pieces of construction paper 
came in because I had I also have like the pieces of paper in the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's kind of like you know I try to keep it very authentic and um, very realistic to how it would look basically, right? Yeah, and I made like sometimes I, I sometimes I don't really use the pastels uh -huh. and I try to like go for a more aged vintage right. look, but I really enjoy like the the pastel construction mm -hmm. paper because I think it looks very cute. It has like um. <laughs> I like how much texture it has in it too. Like it almost has like a uh, texture that like like sawdust or something or like wood like kind of in it. Like it has little yeah. little like I don't even know a little like dust in it. I guess for lack of a better <laughs> word. Yeah, I don't know. Like sometimes it's just recycled paper that got dyed. Mm. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um, but there are like ones that are completely like one color, and there are also ones with the with the little bits in there, as you said. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. I kind of have both, but I don't know. The packaging said exactly the same thing, yeah. so I don't know why I have two different types of paper. That's the beautifulness but... of like <laughs> right. kind of analog stuff, though, is like the variety and the inconsistencies like that make it feel more human and kind of organic. Did you um, did you start that like? Did you start using those color palettes like on the computer um, deliberately, or did you kind of just gravitate those to those like? when you first started or were you like oh these are the colors that are used like in this construction paper and stuff yeah like i did a bit of research on how to on how like punk zine culture work mm -hmm. and all of that for a project i did for uni a while back oh, okay and then you know i was really paying attention to all the details like the color choices for the paper that were used like mostly it was just colors like red or pink and green mm -hmm. and yellow and all of that because these grab your attention more and they are also cheap to get so you know you can have like a colored like cover basically right and then the rest can be white um and that's sort of what i was like imitating like based on how it actually looked back then because you don't really do zines anymore the way you did like in the 80s or the mm -hmm. 90s but i still really like how it looks and how it feels and like the message behind it all so yeah i mean i like pastel colors a lot i'm not gonna lie yeah. <laughs> but i also mainly use them for like the authenticity basically mm -hmm. yeah and like there's something about that like i i we printed some xerox posters and stuff uh for some events like little underground like house shows and stuff we threw in college at our house and putting that like super rich xerox like black on the any colored paper with just the one layer it's like it's so simple but it's really hard to beat something like that like it's just so impactful mm. and you see it like taped up on a piece of wood or like a phone pole from like you know 200 feet away and you're just like i gotta go check that out and see what it is <laughs> right like i think these just look cooler than like the overly designed posters mm -hmm. like that's just my personal taste i'm not saying that either is better or worse but i personally just like the the photocopied look a lot because in a way it just seems so effortless but it manages to like communicate everything mm -hmm. it needs to communicate like the one thing you know you have like a rave party and you're gonna do design that in an according way yeah. but you also print it on paper that's colored because of course you want people to pay attention mm -hmm. and you know visit your little rave party and like i really like how simple yet effective it is really yeah do you think that we'll start seeing uh more of this like i guess so what am I trying to say here? You know how within like fashion and design, like we're kind of repeating this like 20 year cycle where everything was, you know, 90s, like uh, vintage, like sports t-shirts and very like 90s bright. And then everything is right now. I feel like we're, we're on the latter end of like the Y2K, like everything is very futuristic and like PlayStation one, like video game covers and things. And do you think that we'll start to see this kind of, 90s 2000s like counterculture design style in like mainstream like productions or album art or like just bigger and more like i guess global like applications like that i don't know like it always has to do with like a certain subculture mm -hmm. someone identifies in because the kind of style i do that's like very tied to like punk culture like maybe even like rave and techno and all of that like pretty much these countercultures, yeah. as you said. So I personally don't think it will go mainstream. Right. 
in a way that the Y2K trend did, but I do sort of see this punk style being, you know, used for artwork for musicians like, I don't know, Machine Gun Kelly, or who was it recently? I think it was Young Thug or someone that had like a punk concept. Yeah, team and uh, the, what I was always kind of thinking of, the closest I've seen to that being mainstream is like the stuff that Playboy Cardi has done with like the uh, yeah, right, uh, right, whole right. lot of red. Like the thing, the... Right, right, right. That was inspired by an LA magazine, right. the Slash magazine, which was very cool. Like a lot of yeah. people hated the album artwork. And I mean, I agree, it could have been done a bit yeah, better. Yeah, it worse than I the original one. it was one. actually very cool. Yeah. I mean, they, whoever designed that <laughs> yeah. needed to just grab some uh, black market copy scan and throw it on top. It could have helped it out a lot more. Man, I wish they would have just hired me. Because <laughs> uh, he's like, you know, he's a, he has huge reach as like a hip hop artist. And he's actually done a lot of stuff that is uh, speaking to that culture. Like one of the other albums, like I think it's Die Lit or something. It's like uh, him or it's like a picture of people like mosh, like a mosh pit and like a, someone jumping off and like to crowd surf. And yeah, I right. think it's based off of like an old Germs um, album art or magazine or something. So like he's always... Uh, like there's intention behind that and i think it's lost on a lot of people though they don't even know what that stuff yeah. is like i don't think a lot of people didn't know about the um whole lot of red like tribute to the old magazine because they were just worried mm. about like talking shit on it you know and saying that it sucks and that's why <laughs> right. it got so much investigation yeah yeah, I mean, you do have to sort of be in that subculture to understand where it comes from, because, you know, if you come from like a more like rap sort of world mm -hmm. sphere of scene, um, of course, you don't know what Slash magazine is. And, you know, you can't really blame pe people for not knowing what it is because it's like a very underground thing. Right. Um, but, like, but you know, if you are in that sort of subculture and you know where it comes from, like you can appreciate mm -hmm. it, of course. But yeah. I mean, I, I really appreciate that he does all of that, but I guess, as I said before, like people, a certain set of people really relate with that counterculture mm -hmm. and what it stands for in the way that he does, for example. But I don't think someone like Post Malone is going to be right. like rocking a Xerox aesthetic anytime soon because I personally don't think that he relates to that a lot. Yeah, so that's a good point. I don't really think that style is going to go mainstream personally because yeah. of that, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, people really relate with the Y2K PlayStation style because, you know, it's not and people grew up with that aesthetic mm -hmm. and that's why they relate to it but um you know this whole like alternative thing like you know not a lot of people relate to it yeah right <laughs> yeah and what's interesting is um when i was in high school i was going to a lot of like underground rap shows like kind of trap like rowdy uh shows and they kind of had a they had a feeling that was a lot more like punk and like moshing than even the punk shows I went to at the time because all the punk bands I liked were like old you know like everyone in the <laughs> audience was like 40 or 50 or 60 even and because like I was seeing like subhumans and uh descendants and things you know and like obviously they they grow old with the time so it, it felt though when I was going to some of these warehouse shows for like SoundCloud rappers like um these people like Xavier Wolf and all this stuff it felt it felt a lot closer to what that used to be. Like it was almost the new version of, um, I guess like not punk, but like this kind of more energetic type of show you go to. Like you have hardcore and stuff yeah. now, but traditional like punk, I feel like that doesn't really exist. It's just kind of all the old people that are still around or not around, you know? <laughs> it's all evolved into either yeah, hardcore right. or other avenues. Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, all these rap artists, that's like pretty much the new DIY culture, basically, mm -hmm. because all you need these days is like a laptop, an internet connection yeah. and a SoundCloud profile. And that's it, mm -hmm. basically. Like you don't need more to, you know, make music and share it with people. And that's sort of interesting because that's kind of in a way like the new punk scene. Right. Like you can't really say it, but you know, it's like a new approach to that basically. Mm -hmm. I was right? trying to explain this to because someone. Because more people I, grew up around rap. Right. And I, I was trying to explain this to someone and I felt like I couldn't verbalize it in a way. Like I was like, I'm not saying that this music is like this music whatsoever, but yeah, it's more of the DIY. Yeah. And I was, that's a great way to put it because um, yeah, it's just like, that's why it's funny that there's music, uh, like indie is like, you know, independent, but now it's become just like 
a word for like beach rock or like kind of like Mac DeMarco esque <laughs> right. music, and that's not indie if you're playing it at Coachella. You know, it's kind of <laughs> interesting. Yeah, and suddenly everything is post punk as well. Like you have like a, a guitar with some reverb on it, and suddenly it's post punk. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what kind of clients uh, are you? Like, have you been attracting? Have you been kind of getting inquiries from kind of that style, like post punk and gothic, like bands and things? Um, yeah, I had um, a client that uh, did. Oh, it's so hard to verbalize, but I think they're more like in the alternative gothic sphere. Okay. And I designed like album artwork for them, which was very, very cool because I always dreamed of doing mm -hmm. that. And that's sort of the, the crowd I attract, like the people who mainly do like alternative music, indie music and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also like a few brands that are interested in this type of style, which is very cool. Yeah. Has that album, is that out yet? That music? No, it comes in February, which is why I'm not saying anything yeah. more than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll look forward to it. And I've, I'm sure I'll recognize it by how it looked. Did you do the gatefold and everything? <laughs> is it like a full on packaging or just a digital? It's not a gatefold. It's it's just a regular vinyl, mm. but it has like an inlay. Oh, cool. Right. And also digital. Yeah, that's awesome. Like that's um, I've done a few album covers that only ever lived on like Spotify and SoundCloud. So that. That's like definitely one of my goals too. Even though I'm not big on like album art, uh, I would love to design an actual physical um, sleeve and everything because that seems fun. Yeah, that was super cool because that was actually the first project I really agreed mm -hmm. to do. And it was super cool. Like it was always a dream of mine to design like vinyl or even a CD or something like that, like something you can actually hold. Yeah. And maybe you show someone along the way of your life and say, I actually designed mm -hmm. that. And that's very, very cool that that was actually the first bigger commission I got. Like yeah. very cool experience to do that. It's going to be right. dope once you actually get it too. Once you get the, once they press it and everything. Right, right, right. I'm really looking forward to that. Like, that's really cool. Like, even if my PC was hardcore struggling <laughs> with all the files at the time, but I still think it turned out very, very cool. And I hope I get to do more of that in the future. Like, I really enjoy doing, like, all the physical stuff that's getting to be mm -hmm. printed because I do have a printing background. So I really enjoy just seeing printed things. Yeah, and what... Uh... <laughs> What was I going to say? Oh, uh, how has uh, how has it been with the new computer? A lot, your life a lot easier. <laughs> it's definitely easier. <laughs> yeah, for context, I <laughs> I had like a, a rather cheap like Windows laptop uh -huh. before because the computer I had before that couldn't handle the programs anymore, and then suddenly the computer I got last year. Um, it also yeah. couldn't handle my yeah. <laughs> my programs, but luckily I I saved up a bit and I finally went and bought a MacBook, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I don't regret it. Yeah, it's too many uh, too many textures. You know, it's uh, a lot easy to have a small computer <laughs> right. when you're just working in like Illustrator with vectors and stuff. But once you start getting those big PSB files, yeah, they they start sounding like they're yeah. gonna blast off into space. <laughs> right, exactly. Like when you have the the huge like texture files that are often like, I don't know, something crazy, like 1,200 DPI or mm -hmm. something. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> that's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that was, um, that must've been pretty uh, like um, rewarding considering you, you like uh, built up this kind of following and now you're pretty much just freelancing and going to school and then you're able to pretty much fund uh, that MacBook purchase. I mean, I'm sure that was like super dope. <laughs> Yeah, that, w that was very exciting. Like, um, I took my dad with me <laughs> when <laughs> I bought it. And that was actually so embarrassing. But in Germany, we pay everything with cash money. Yeah. And then there was my first purchase with my bank card. Oh, okay. It wa I was super anxious because it was a lot of money mm -hmm. <laughs> that I had to pay. And um, <laughs> when the purchase went through, I was like hugging my dad and almost crying. Like, yeah, it went through. I have a new laptop. Yeah. <laughs> just standing in this tech store getting overly emotional because <laughs> the purchase went through <laughs> yeah. and because I finally had a MacBook you know that's very cool like I paid for it all myself that's very amazing like I right. didn't think like a year ago that I would be able to do that mm -hmm. you know that's very rewarding obviously yeah for sure and do you um how have you liked the do you like the OS better on the Apple 
Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I was super anxious at first because I was a Windows user all my life, but then I know I don't know. I used Apple like a bit at internships a mm. while ago because they were a design agency, so of course they used like macOS. But um, I don't know, I, I had to get used to it a bit, but now I'm just like, oh my God, why is this so much easier? Yeah. Like AirDrop, like I've Procreate on my iPad, I just send like a file over to my laptop. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the I want to live without that. AirDrop's such a small <laughs> thing that is, if you've never used it, like you don't really see why it's that big of a deal. Like if you've always been on Windows, yeah. I'm always like, oh, I just email or I put something on Google Drive and download it. But when I used to be on... Uh, on my MacBook, like, man, AirDrop is just something else. Like, it's not worth $5,000 yeah. difference in price or whatever, <laughs> but it is really nice. I would have a, in a perfect world, I'd have my PC and I'd probably have a iMac or a Mac Pro, just desktop as well. But yeah. That's kind of excessive at this point. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, I was already thinking about, like, oh, am I going to get a Mac Mini at some point in the mm -hmm. future because I do have my laptop for home use because, you know, I commute to uni and all of that. So it's just right. more practical. But also for home use, I kind of just want something I don't have to, like, plug in and out all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the ports can stay fresh a bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's very expensive. But, um, yeah, for now, I'm just like, man, I got this laptop not even a month ago. Why am I already thinking about, right. like, another computer? I definitely don't have the money for <laughs> and no use at the moment. I mean, those things are pretty strong like i know a lot of my friends they just get one of those um like wooden like stands where you put the laptop in and then you just plug it into one of the pro like pro xdr displays or whatever like the ones that apple sells and that's pretty much the imac at that point you know it's just as powerful <laughs> as some of the mid-end like imac so i mean you, sh you could look into that because there is something nice about having like the actual monitor that's the only thing that throws me off on the laptops you're just kind of hunched over and stuff and i like my mechanical keyboards yeah. so i can't really <laughs> get around that same like i use I use my laptop like a desktop pretty much like I also have it on like a little stand like mm -hmm. next to me but I also have like a shit lot of plugs in the background because you know I have like a webcam attached and a microphone and all of that and I also use like an external monitor and all of that right. so did you ever get that, was that keyboard why I was thinking you know, do you want to see my yeah. keyboard I got a mechanical keyboard sorry for uh, audio listeners K8. but there's the oh there it is that looks so similar to mine in the color color scheme you know, you can even change, like, the colors. It has all these fun, like, modes and all of that. It's, <laughs> it's yeah, so fun. that's cool. What, what kind is that? <laughs> um, that is a Keychron K8. Oh, okay. I got the one with linear that's their switches newer, uh, with the, the newer Gateron Keychron Reds. one, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mainly got like a Keychron because, you know, it has like all the Mac keys mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't need to reprogram it or anything. Is it, oh, so, so it already has, you know, um, I just got that. It has command, an option instead? Yeah. Oh, oh that's God. dope. You want to see? I can show you. And now it has like all the, the, oh, yeah. the Mac keys, like control and all of that. So yeah, that's cool. I had a Razor before, but it wasn't like compatible with like all the, the right. Mac commands. But this one is really nice because it has like shortcuts for like Siri also has like a screenshot shortcut mm -hmm. which is really neat so <laughs> yeah i used to use i think <laughs> yeah what I, if i'm i remember i think the mac one was like uh command shift four right to pull up the <laughs> screenshot yeah, yeah, thing. right Com command shift four yeah like it's a bit of a weird combo because on windows it was like either Snipping you tool. like <laughs> press one of the toggles or something yeah <laughs> right or it was like i don't know like it was also like windows key and print or something mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool though. I, I mean, but now it's like I, I, I'm glad that now I know that those ones work with Mac because I don't know. I feel like once I get the MacBook, I'm gonna be like, <laughs> fuck these switches, you know? Like I'm so I use the <laughs> fuck these switches. I use the, the the browns, so like I really like the I don't like the blue because they're way too clicky, but I don't like the red either. Yeah. You have the cherry red, right? <laughs> I have to get one red. Yeah, exactly. I don't like the red though yeah, these either. These are pretty much cherry reds. I don't know. I like the in between, the browns, where I like to live at. Sorry for anyone that doesn't care about anything about keyboards, but that's a, if you're going to have to yeah. listen to the podcast, you're probably going to end the channel. You're probably going to have to get used to a little bit more talk about mechanical keyboards.
<laughs> I can continue it. Like I had like a very clicky, annoying like Razer membrane keyboard. Mm. I mainly got it because it was cheap at the time, but over time I realized how loud it was. I know. Because I listened back to the streams I did with Adobe a while ago and I was like, of course, like I had to press keys and you know my room is like yeah. really, really wide. Like I don't have my walls covered, I don't have a lot of furniture here, so of course it's a bit echoey. Mm. And then you could hear in my microphone because it stood right next to it. My loud as Razer keyboard, like click, right. click, 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 click. Or when you're on like it a meeting uh, call with like a client and you're writing notes <laughs> and it's just it's so loud, just going. <laughs> that was so awful. That was a perfect um, segue, though. I wanted to ask you about um, how was it like working with Adobe? We talked a little bit in the Discord chat, but I was kind of curious, like, what you thought about the whole kind of process and everything. Yeah, it was very cool. Like, um, you know, randomly one day I got an email from some studio manager over at Adobe, like, hey, um, you know, we're doing this whole Adobe Live thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get to stream for an hour and also you get compensation. Yeah, so, yeah. of course, I was like, man, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so I had like a first stream over at the, the German Adobe channel, which was very, very cool very very fun like the community was super nice you know you have like a live chat when you stream over on behance, behance yeah. you know, i always stream it on behance their portfolio like website um but that was very very fun you know i had a very nice host yeah um and it was just a lot of fun to like interact with her and to interact with the chat and to just you know show what i do best basically right yeah so do they um you did the first one you did i know was in german so do they um do they do different uh live streams for all like different languages and stuff yeah they have uh, i'm not really sure but they do um an english one and i think a french one and i also did one with adobe uk that was the english one right um where i basically showed what i did um where what i did in the german one but you know i, <laughs> I of course like i changed my photoshop to english so people would understand what i'm doing basically yeah. does it are you slower when you're working in the english interface yeah, it's very confusing because, you know, I went to college and had like the formal training there, but it was in the German Photoshop yeah. version. So for the past like five or six years, I only use Photoshop in German. So I know all the design terms best in German because, you know, that's my native language. Right. That's a language I pretty much work in. So when I was in the English version, I was like, wait, that's not where it's supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> that was a bit confusing but you know <laughs> it worked out somehow <laughs> yeah ger uh, my girlfriend's been doing the duolingo german uh for like the past few months i, I need to get on it she keeps bothering me because i'm supposed to go to germany next year and a few other places in europe oh. and it's hard like the the <laughs> the characters and stuff are quite confusing compared to what i'm used to and like it's very um the language is very like deliberate like you gotta say it with some uh <laughs> some passion i feel like when you're doing the pronunciation of <laughs> right. things right 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 like oh my god people always say like oh my god german is such a harsh language or you know english people english speaking people feel super funny when they ask me to pronounce hospital in german mm -hmm. or like butterfly in german but they're always disappointed when i say it because you know german is not that harsh of a language actually yeah. <laughs> yeah like when i talk normally it sounds like a bit softer of mm -hmm. course you know like i do have an accent when i speak because you know the the words they all sound so differently mm -hmm. like that's why i talk a bit weird in english because german is like a bit of a harsher language right. but when did you did yeah. you all, uh, <laughs> learn english kind of simultaneously as you learned german or did you start with one when you were younger Mm, so when I went to elementary school, they started teaching English in third grade. So I don't know oh, okay. how old I was. I was like eight or nine at the time when I first started it. And then, you know, I just kind of kept at it, you know, like doing the whole internet stuff, like watching YouTube right. videos and wanting to <laughs> understand like the Smosh videos about Pokemon and yeah. stuff like that. That's what's weird about um, <laughs> but, you other know, countries is uh, they... A lot of European countries, like Germany, they uh, it seems like they have a lot of emphasis on people knowing how to speak English as well. Like uh, when you do yeah. classes in in the U.S., like 
you know, everyone in California would take like Spanish in high school, right? Or maybe German if like, if we had it, like I did sign language because it was the one that was like where you don't want to try. That's cool. <laughs> it was just like, whatever. <laughs> um, but like, it, there's not as much like, it's not like as required or anything, you know? So that's cool yeah. that it must be like, I don't know. I want to know like two languages like that. It seems very helpful. Yeah, the thing is, I also had French classes, but mm. I don't know. I had like a teacher I really liked the first year I did it, but then she got pregnant and had to leave <laughs> the school I yeah. was at. Uh, I was so sad. Like, I was happy for her because, you know, she was super happy. She wanted a child and I was like, OK, that's mm -hmm. great. But then I had like this French teacher that I absolutely couldn't stand. So I didn't keep up with French and oh, I just yeah. had bad grades all throughout high school because, you know, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't drop the class, mm -hmm. you know, like in Germany to get like the, the highest high school degree. Basically, you need to know two foreign languages that can either be like, of course, English as the base language, you know, like English is mandatory, but you could also have like Latin, oh, okay. French, Spanish at the school I was at. Some schools, they even teach like Russian or Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, and that it's, like it's not uncommon that people here know two or more languages because you know Germany is like in the very center of Europe. Right. So you know there's like uh, Eastern Europe and there's also like more Western Europe, like France and Spain and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's very useful, basically. Yeah, and really. it's uh, the teacher. It's so important, like not just with languages, but design courses and and any like vocational like education. The Man, when the professor sucks, like it really takes you out of like it, school is already like, you know, I have mixed opinions on if I think it's valuable uh, fully or not. But when the professors are cool, yeah. it really gives you like some hope and you can tell that they're passionate about the subject. But when they're just kind of there like fucking off and it seems like they're not very <laughs> like interested in helping, it really like sucks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing, because, you know, I guess the woman that taught French back then, she, like, knew French, but she, you know, we were like a mix of three different classes that had to be taught mm. in that course. But she didn't particularly like the kids from my class a lot. <laughs> uh, and she let us know that for some reason, like, even though we were like quiet and trying to participate, yeah. but we just weren't her favorites. And that kind of sucked. So all of us kind of slacked off. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um with the uh. <laughs> I kind of got distracted but with the Adobe stuff did you um how do you how do they how do you think they select that stuff because I've seen people that you know I have no idea who they are all the way to like these designers that I really look up to and stuff do you know how they like what was the yeah. process like when they reached out to you I don't really know like it's mainly over social media mm. I believe because they also messaged Tyler Foxrocket who was also yeah, on the podcast before. Yeah he did the British one right? Or um, the UK one or right. whatever? Like I think he got the email around the same time as I did so I would guess that it's mainly like social media yeah, that makes sense. attention e because I think Elliot is a cool guy also worked with them before. So, you know, like I did like the whole tutorials doing like, no, you can do a photocopy effect in Adobe Photoshop. Yeah. And Tyler was also like how I work in Adobe Photoshop. So right. <laughs> I guess they just kind of looked at the content that does well. And like if these people like sort of advertise for Photoshop before or something right. like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe I needed to just get on. I'll have to do a stream for like black market or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe maybe you should just do like a few reels, like how I work in Adobe Photoshop. Yeah, I guess that's the you got to get the SEO going so they could look you up. Exactly. That's like um recently <laughs> I switched my name or whatever on Instagram to like Jesse Nyberg graphic designer or whatever, like because I've heard that when they look that up it shows in the in the search bar or whatever, and I don't know if it works or not, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it all it works for you, definitely. Yeah. Have you um, <laughs> how how has it been? Like, are you back in um, like uh, in person school or university? No, no, I have I have another online semester because all the courses I chose, like I thought some of them were in person, which is why which is what I like built my schedule around basically. Uh -huh. But then I got messages from all of the teachers basically being like, Oh, just so you know, this course is gonna be online. So I was like Yeah. You thought are so summer <laughs> in person already though at the university? Uh, 
probably yeah. like they're probably gonna do full in person but for now it's like a really weird system like before you even get to enter the building you have to get like a little like festival pen or <laughs> something that states that you're like vaccinated oh, or you survived word. covid before you know and you gotta pick that up once daily oh, damn. so i kind of hope they figure out like a better way to do does that does it feel more <laughs> organized though than the last year like do they do they have the online stuff more figured out or not really yeah the thing is they had it figured out like pretty well because i think they switched to online in a span of like two weeks like they had the whole like microsoft team stuff mm -hmm. figured out um, and, you know, the teachers, they all seem like they got better at it through the past year or so. So, yeah. you know, it's not bad. It's kind of just annoying because, you know, you don't really get to meet the people that study there. You don't really get to network, like even with like the students and other teachers and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that kind of sucks because that doesn't really work as well online. Yeah. So yeah. Unfortunate. That's a, I always said, like, I felt kind of empathy for or sympathy, I don't know which one it is, or for the people that were going to school online, because I, I graduated the the next year, or the maybe the year after I graduated is when COVID happened. So I graduated in 2019. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, 80% of the value I got out of school was being around the people, for sure. And like, I stand by yeah, that. Right. Like, uh, some of the groups I worked in sucked and like with business students and stuff, working with them on corporate design, oh like they're kind of assholes and whatnot. But like the other designers, <laughs> I mean, I have made great friends and like it was good to see their perspective, the critiques and all that. But without that, it feels very like, you know, just go on Skillshare or something. In for almost. <laughs> right. Like that's mainly why I did like the whole social media stuff. So intensively yeah. in a way because i didn't really get to network with, via my uni so instead i was like oh, okay you know i'm like rather extroverted i just check people up all the damn mm -hmm. time so i'm just gonna focus on that for the time being but you know it kind of sucks to not really know any students because you know you can like work together with these people at some point or you could even like give them jobs at some point right. but you know i mean it's worked out know, better like, for you though by uni. like uh, you're who knows yeah. what you would have been doing online you know if you had more to do in irl <laughs> Yeah, right. I don't know. But I'm definitely going to keep the whole social media stuff up mm -hmm. because it's a lot of fun to like connect and meet all these people. And, you know, some interesting collapse and all of that can happen through that. And that's also very valuable. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And uh, have a uh, do you chat with the classmates like on like like this at all, like online or like on calls and stuff? Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, sometimes you have these group projects or something and, you know, out of these you get like friends sometimes mm -hmm. and like you meet with these people in like smaller groups or something just to get to know each other. And yeah, I'd say I <laughs> I have a few friends at my university, luckily, because I think some people, they didn't get to network as much. Right. Um, and that gets pretty lonely, mm -hmm. I can imagine, but I kind of wanted to prevent that. So, you know, I was always trying to engage like in group work and stuff like that. So, you know, oh God, it, it sounds so bad when I say it, but you know, like people recognize my name at some yeah, point. Yeah, I was going to so, ask you, know, you, you that. You gotta leave like a certain impression. Did you, um, <laughs> right. when you first, like, uh, when did you notice that? Or like, how did that happen? Like, were you in a call and, and they <laughs> knew your work or did they know you just by uh, seeing your name on the screen or whatever? <sighs> I don't even know. Like I was doing some kind of, I don't, I don't know. We were put in like a breakout room mm -hmm. and like a person I talked with the week before, they were suddenly super nice to me. <laughs> and I was wondering why. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was thinking like, oh, okay, they probably saw my Instagram. Like it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny but you know it's kind of it kind of sucks because you know i don't want to come off as if i'm flexing mm -hmm. on other students or something because you know i yeah. put a lot of working with work adobe into what I do. <laughs> right 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 like that, that was amazing like i'm very grateful that happened and i don't think like i'm like anything better than other students yeah. because of that but i know sometimes i wish people wouldn't be extra nice and that they would just be honest mm. to me <laughs> yeah, I, I never know, knew like anyone. Kind of I feel like uh, all the people I know uh, online, like my design online friends or whatever you want to call them, I don't really know too many. Like now that I live in LA, I have design uh, 
I don't know, friends or acquaintances that are pretty successful and stuff. But when I was going to school in, in Chico in nor- Northern California, you know, I probably had the most followers in my class and it was like 900, you know, <laughs> like no one had no, everyone yeah, just right. had normal accounts. It wasn't like, you know, poster a day. Everyone was posting like them at the bar and shit like that. Like it was very, it was very <laughs> different. So like I could imagine people would interact differently with people, you know, if like, yeah. Someone like that had a following like Roy Cranston or something when he was doing the challenge oh was, God, was just yeah. in your class. They'd probably be like all bothering him or something like that, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Like, you know, when people have like questions about the whole thing, like, you know, of course I answer mm-hmm. or something like when when they are just genuinely interested. But some people, they just really <laughs> want a story to share or something. And then I'm always just like... I appreciate it, but I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't want to come off as rude or anything, but, you know. Right. Oh, uh, they're trying to get that people clout. Just see, <laughs> people just see follower counts, and then they get a bit blinded by that, and they don't really yeah, see, like, you Yeah, you could know, be the, the next uh, reshare page and that, pay right? for story shoutouts. <laughs> <laughs> Watch me do that tomorrow. Yeah. One story share, 20 years. Yeah, she's going to be like, you're going to be like a meme I need content. your glasses. <laughs> You can be like the next design humor, but just sharing gothic uh, design, design memes. Humor. You know, I'm just I'm just gonna name drop. But Duran made like a meme page that was like called my bloody graphic design or something, right. <laughs> and that is so funny. Yeah, that's, that's there was good. one that, that was saying like uh, leaving my mental health behind for graphic design or something. Yeah, yeah, I saw uh, Duran. <laughs> I think it was as well. He just posted some meme. It was like just a photoshop like interface and it was like this is where my life was ruined or some shit like that right like that is so funny like designer humor uh i saw elliot post about it i'm just gonna name drop but elliot posted about it recently because they made fun of people using Canva yeah they're pretty again. cringe over it's there just like this joke is so old at this point like People don't have to use Photoshop yeah. to do graphic design. That, um, My God, it's 2021. I think uh, uh, a lot of younger designers, especially self-taught ones that didn't go to school, like someone like Elliot, they definitely have a way different perspective on it. Like he's probably on the extreme of like, do whatever you want, you know, like no rules. And then designer humor is like, just so like old guard, like gatekeepy, like let's make jokes yeah. about papyrus and stuff like every five minutes. And <laughs> I think seeing those two, like so seeing old. them clash is funny because I you know I probably live somewhere on the scale closer to Elliot, but not all the way, you know, somewhere in the yeah, 30% right. or whatever. But it's funny because you look in those comments on those pages and like these old like corporate design people, like they're just so cringe, like the shit that they say, they're just like, wow, that's pathetic. <laughs> like you could never use Canva. Like, are you kidding me? Like client would laugh in your face or something like some bullshit like that. <laughs> You know, I'm just gonna say it, like Canva is actually really useful. Yeah. I've seen people present like, I don't know, like PowerPoint slides made in Canva and they look absolutely fine. Right. Like, you know, if it fits your use, then just use it. Like mm-hmm. it's not that deep really. Also like if you're a bad designer and you're using Canva, yeah, it'll be bad. If you're a bad designer and use Photoshop, yeah, right. it's gonna be bad also, you know? It's not the, the program doesn't, uh, like really fix anything if you if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like a lot of people underestimate that and especially like newer designers. Like I was like a bit blinded because I started out using, uh, what was it? Gimp? Yeah. Gimp, right? With the Gimp. little like mouse or whatever uh, I it is. I started out using Gimp. <laughs> right? yeah. And everything like looked so awful. And then I found like... Um, a not quite legal version of Photoshop CS6. And then I was like, okay, my stuff is instantly gonna look better. But then I did the same yeah. things and I was like, why the fuck does it still look awful? Right. It's, <laughs> you know, it's not about the program. It's about, you know, how you use exactly. it really. It's the same way. Um, uh, I have a lot of friends that are like, that paint acrylic and oil and stuff. And they're really talented and everyone's always like, what, what do you, what paint do you use? What brushes do you use? Like what, what supplies? And like, they're always just like, it's not the fucking paint, you know, like I could use the paint from the dollar <laughs> store and still look like this. Like it's about the technique and the practice and the style. Like, I don't know. I think people yeah, want right. to, people really want to think that, you know, you could just, there's a one easy fix to everything, but there isn't. Yeah. 
like a lot of people, like a lot of young designers also think that they need a MacBook to be a good designer, right. but you know, you need to know how to design first. Like, you know, computers and programs, they are just tools to, you know, put the images yeah. in your head yeah. into something that is actually visual. Mm. You know, like you need to have that skill first before you go and spend all of your money on like a Photoshop subscription right. or like Affinity or before you spend like the, oh God, however many thousands of dollars on a MacBook yeah. or something. Like, you know, it's not about the tools. It's about, you know, how you can visualize what goes on in your noggin. Right. And especially the style that you work in, like they were doing that with layouts on a scanner, you know, like in just everything. Yeah, by right. Hand. And no, they weren't like, like saying... You know, they weren't like, no one was telling them like, oh, you need to be doing that on the computer, you know, or even when the computer came out, it just, I think eventually we won't even have like programs. We'll just be working in like some kind of AR, like <laughs> weird visual, like VR space and just like kind of be in Photoshop, like inside of it or some shit. <laughs> that would honestly be weird, but it would also be kind of fun. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's like what I try to tell like a lot of younger people who message me being like, do I need Photoshop or something? And I'm like, no, you obviously don't. Like you can get free textures. Like I use free textures mm -hmm. for the longest time. Like I didn't even use like paid textures when I didn't make any money with design. But you know, the more money I got from client right. work, basically, I got to invest in like the, the copy scan. I got to invest in like better paper textures and all of that. Right. But Really, in the end, it's about how you make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, and that's a good feeling when you get to the, I remember getting to the point where I stopped getting fonts illegally and started paying for shit online, you know, because like, and then it's just a, once you, once you're a freelancer, then it's just like, that's a tax write off, baby. You know, you got the, buy the textures, throw it in a, just keep track of it at the end of the year, can write it off. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I try to, I like also like, it feels good to buy something from like smaller people too, you know, buying a texture pack yeah, right. or a font Like you from know someone. where the money gets to. Right, exactly. Mm. Like, you know, Black Market, they're like a huge brand, but you also know it's like a few people mm -hmm. and mainly like Kisi yeah. behind the brand who do like most of the work. Right. But, um, you know, like when you know the people behind it and the work that goes into it, like the prices like Black Market offer, they're like completely fair for what oh, you yeah. get, so... You know, I'm happy to spend all of my money yeah, there, basically. hundred percent. I feel like uh, you know? Black Market has such a stranglehold on, like, the Instagram design community. <laughs> like, every time they drop a pack, I just, in my head, I think, all right, well, this is what's going to be going on for the next few months, you know? <laughs> Yeah, they're trendsetters, basically. They say like, okay, I, we're releasing this pack and you're all going to love it and this is going to dominate Instagram for the next six months. Yeah. Like um, Ink Lab, it's still going so strong and I don't know when it was released. Like, when was... when was My battery died, but the camera you're died. good. <laughs> I oh, got no. it, I'm switching it. <laughs> yeah, Ink Lab was probably released like, I don't know, 2020 early or late 2020 or... Maybe even earlier yeah, right. than and that. And you still see it in use. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I mean, Inclab is like, that's like my blessing and my curse. I feel like I rely on it too much, <laughs> but I've also, some of the stuff I've been able to mess around with it in, I think is, it's one of those things that's like, um, it can honestly not do anything at all for you if you don't use it right. But if you figure out little strategies and techniques, it's uh, very powerful. And yeah. I like to see what... Um, a lot of people have done a lot of different shit with it. Like, uh, you know, um, yeah. made by motel. I mean, he's like the ink lab king and the, he's like, uh, he's a big, uh, texture inspiration for me and just, he, he's, he's dope with it. And, uh, I think, but it's like you said, like what we were saying about Canva and Photoshop, like you could have ink lab, you could have all the black market textures, you could have Photoshop, but if you don't have the the um yeah like in your noggin i guess like you were saying that it's it's gonna turn out bad regardless of how many filters you throw on it yeah you know? yeah like that's what i always try to tell people like also on the contrary that you don't need to buy assets that you can also use like pure photoshop and just layer like all these you know like the filter mm -hmm. gallery layers you could also do like other filters and stuff like that and stack all of that to get to the effect you want like you just got to experiment a bit and you also got to know what you're going yeah. for. 
but you could also just like experiment and make something entirely new right but you know you don't need to do assets to do anything yeah, like you know it's useful to know how photoshop works before you mm -hmm. get like the ink lab and all of that not advertising against it obviously <laughs> yeah. but you know it, it's probably best to experiment first and not put all your money into assets that might not work for you right like you could do a lot of things with with just like pure Photoshop or even with like Photo P, which is like a web yeah. app. It does exactly the same things as Photoshop, and also my tutorials work on there. So just saying, right. I mean, you uh, <laughs> I tested them. You out. pretty much um, created a nice little career from yourself off the what is it the uh, uh, is it the what is it the filter gallery there we go that's what i was thinking of <laughs> yeah the filter gallery <laughs> i was thinking of the specific yeah, one great. i forgot like, I what it's called i always encourage people right <laughs> i mean i always encourage people to take a look at mm -hmm. it just like play with the different filters stack them and everything like you know you can achieve like really cool effects with just like the filter gallery with like oh, what is it God, pencil strokes is that the called. one you use is that what it's called pencil stroke yeah. yeah 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 that one it's called something completely different in german so yeah. pencil stroke was the correct word yeah um but you know you could also adjust that you can like plop layers on top of that or underneath that and then you get like all these interesting effects and you know it's like worth like spending a few mm -hmm. minutes um just playing with it stacking filters seeing how they interact with each other you know, it's really cool. Like you can get a lot of cool effects with just the software right. you're using. What um, what kind of stuff are you looking to kind of work on throughout the rest of the year? Any specific type of client projects or personal things you're looking forward to? I don't know. For for the moment, I'm kind of just going with the flow mm -hmm. and seeing how like my studies go, how things develop. If I just keep like posting on Instagram, being like, "Hey guys, I take commissions yeah. right now." <laughs> Um, but you know, there's nothing specific planned. Like I always like to be surprised with the proposals I get in my inbox. Mm -hmm. So nothing specific. I kind of just want to like do stuff. I want to release prints prints later this year. Yeah, like where's the work. Xerox prints at? We got it. We got to get them. <laughs> <Right. em. laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work to like optimize all the poses I did from the 365 oh, right, no. to be like actually printed because, you know, I have like the, the very thin borders on the side, but you know, there needs to be a bit more space right. with bleeding and all of that. So it takes a while, yeah. but it's going to come eventually. So that's like the only thing I have planned to like release a few mm -hmm. prints this year. But, you know, anything else that comes, I don't know yet. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since I've been doing the prints, it's been going okay. And um, it's a, uh, I never, I don't like doing the, you know, DTG or whatever you want to call it. So um, I've been doing it all myself, like the printing and the fulfillment and the shipping and signing them and all this. And I think it's, I don't know. There's something that I don't feel right. I don't feel okay with just letting it go out without seeing what's going on. Like I need the QC, you know, and, uh, yeah. but it's definitely a lot more yeah. work and I feel like I have to charge a lot more for shipping so far and printing and yeah. all the time going to the post office and whatnot. Yeah. That's the thing. Like time, you know, I work for clients. I have to do like work for uni and stuff like that. Right. So uh, like having them printed and shipped to me is not really an option, sadly, because I would obviously like to like insert stuff like stickers or like little notes that say, hey, thank you mm. for the support or something. But that's not possible, unfortunately, right. for now. So I'm going to uh, have some printer do that for me, do all the shipping and all of that. Um, at least until I find a way how, yeah. you know, I can do Just it as long as you, from you home know, or something, you, you, you find know? some, like, you know, time and money is a thing sadly for me. Right. So. Yeah. And you find someone that's good. Then as long as the, the quality is good, it's like, it's all good. I've just, I, yeah. I'm just always afraid of, uh. I don't know. I've I've gotten I've heard some stories of shitty uh, people that fulfill prints, and they're all when they get them, they're all you know crumpled or misplaced and stuff. Yeah. But I know that I know there's. Yeah, some that's good what ones. I'm also spending a lot of time on, right? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Though, have you? Um, do you have any? Uh, so I know clients throughout the that you have booked right now throughout the rest of the year. Uh, 
I'm talking to yeah. a few people right now, but nothing's really said yet. I also don't want to jinx anything, so I can't say more yeah, than that. Yeah, for sure. What do you think? Uh, what yeah. are you kind of most proud of that you've worked on since uh, we last chatted? Definitely the, the vinyl. vinyl artwork we talked about because I never thought that would be my first commission. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also really, really proud to have worked together with Adobe because you yeah. know, I'm very young. You know, I just started my career as a designer, basically, even though I've been doing it for a while. Right. But I really just started to earn money with it. So it's really cool to have worked with a company like Adobe this early on in my career, basically. Mm-hmm. So it makes me feel very empowered to keep doing what I do and see where I end up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do. It seems like the growth and opportunities you've been getting are, have been pretty uh, exponential over the past six yeah, months. Right. Like we said in the beginning, I mean, both of us, like the, it's very, I'm a very, I'm in a very different place in my life than we last chatted. I was still working full time. I didn't have quite the same amount of clients or self-employment income and things. And, you know, you, you were still on your three, six, five. Now you're working with Adobe flexing on your classmates. And, uh, <laughs> and all that (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it's pretty cool like you know life changes so fast sometimes when you just keep doing your stuff keep being consistent and all of that and you can end up doing very cool stuff basically yeah sometimes i'm uh it sucks like it's so bittersweet like what's gone on the past few years but sometimes (laughs) i i I hate to say it, but sometimes I feel like I wouldn't even be where I'm at without the without COVID just because I didn't have the time to I didn't have the opportunity to waste time to go out or to do other stuff like I was forced to. There's so many weekends I would have been going out rather or hanging with friends. But instead, I was working on videos or working in Photoshop and all this stuff. Yeah, same. Like, I'm not a huge advocate for, like, this whole hustle culture. Like, you need to be working every day in order to be successful in life. But, you know, the 365, as I mentioned, like, earlier, like, it was something I eased myself into because I really mm-hmm. liked to do it and because I really liked seeing the amount of improvements I saw in the very short time. But I definitely wouldn't have done it if there wasn't COVID. Like, I would have probably did the same thing if I had, like, yeah. in-person classes at the time because, you know, I started it around the time I started uni. So, you know, if it was all in person, like the project would have either never yeah. existed or ended completely different, basically. Right. So, right. Yeah, well, I mean, um, other than that, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to keep doing. And it was great to chat again. And if you guys want to hear a little bit more, we're going to do a Q&A for the Patreon. Got some questions for Caroline here, but it was great talking again. And you can, uh, where do you want people to go find you? Just on Instagram? Anything else you want to plug? <laughs> yeah, you can go to my Instagram. It's caroline.dietl. Yeah. And I also have a Twitter. It's the same username, but with an underscore. But as a warning, I do a lot of shit posting, <laughs> so don't expect too much design. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I have to plug for now. All right, cool. Well, thank you, and we'll see you guys next time. Peace out. Bye-bye.